talking about <clears throat> different things that happen in the Sharks world, what we've talked about, especially in terms of, you know, hockey sense and decision making and the simplification of it. So, Mason, would you introduce yourself, please? Hey, Daryl. Um, first, I'll say, like, uh, awesome video with some great ideas. That's kind of how I got brought to the group. And uh, in terms of my background, uh, played seven years as a pro in the East Coast Hockey League, uh, did a lot of player coaching the last couple of years, uh, and then I transitioned into the KRS, Coonland Stars um, organization in the Women's League up here in Russia with Brian Adolski, and uh, really just been immersed in a lot of this uh, it's a whole different feel. The first time working with uh, women and understanding, uh, like it was really cool. Like when you talked about some of the terminology you had to use, because it's much different than with the men's side, and uh, how to get them to buy into certain things that you want them to do. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Daryl. Women's. Yeah, I think it's 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 just like anything. I think that. Often we view, like men and women, we view them, of course, very differently because they are, they think differently, they talk differently, they respond in different ways. But it's also the same as age group. You know, I view it the same way. It's just evolving your vocabulary and the things that you're using uh, to talk to people based on what's appropriate for that population. So, you know, you got kids that are five and six years old. You're going to use different terminology than you would if they were 14 or 12 or 14. And then if there's a gender difference, then you're going to change that as well. So I think that one of the things we have to do is just have a better understanding of, at the end of the day, it's not up to the player to communicate the message. It's up to you. You're the coach. If you want them to do something, it's really up to you. Now, if you have a captive audience and kids are respectful and they want to learn, and that's helpful. But at the end of the day, you have to come up with the vehicle that drives your message. And I'm of the opinion that it doesn't really matter what it is. You just, whatever's effective, do it. Because you can be the smartest person and have the best message. But if you don't have a vehicle that delivers it in a way that they can understand, none of it really matters. And that's a real core principle that I, I really believe in. I think that communication is everything. And that's why I love talking about it. I, I've got, I really like to understand vocabulary, how we use vocabulary. And I'm often in situations as well where I have people that I'm working with who do not speak English as their first language, which is a challenge, which makes yeah, you yeah. have to adjust to speak. So those are all real factors that weigh into my life all the time. And so I can't think that I'm any different than anybody else. Um, I feel like everyone has the same issue. So I love hearing about the, the dog, the fox. We used to talk about, we used to talk about it very different, uh, very similarly. We had three layers and you called them different names. I think one, we called one the rabbit, I think, it was the rabbit and the fox. Something along those lines, but... It's just the whole idea of creating a visual in their mind about what their role is. Um, then you evolve. Like when you're older, we start talking about triangles. And then you start trying to figure out shapes. So the best part about understanding a triangle is I have to find the triangle. I have to look. I have to, I have to evaluate more of the ice than what I would normally evaluate. So sometimes mm -hmm. using shapes using shapes and triangles and, you know, try, then we switch from that. We start talking about diamonds. So now what's, what's a diamond? Well, four sides. So I'm going to know where four people are on the ice. That just expands my vision. So any, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's not uh, what you say, it's how you say it. And if we want them to have better hockey sense, we want them to make better decisions. That usually comes from what they see. What they see influences their decisions. You're trying to expand what they see. So, like I said, we you can go from, you know, the fox, the 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 fox and the and the eagles. You can go from that to then triangle. Hey, we want to make a triangle around the puck. 
and a triangle up the puck, and one person links both the triangles. Okay. So I, where the hell, who am I? Where am I? What, what's my role here? I, I think that whether it's that or it's something else, I don't care what it is, but I'm always interested in every approach that's like that because, like I said, I think that at the heart of it, you have to communicate it, but if you want them to express it, it's what they see. So that's always, the, it's not what they hear, it's what they see. What they see is how they make decisions. Well, how you communicate it is what they're looking for. So all the tactics that we've talked about so far is instructing the player to look for something. And I think that at the core of it, that's what, that's what you're trying to do when you expand Hockey Sense. So that's my thoughts on it anyways. That's good. <clears throat> that's Thanks, great, Darryl. Darryl. Some, Go some ahead, good, Tim. Some good thoughts there. Um, the, the one thing that came to my mind, Al, when you were talking about um, the Eagles maybe not identifying somebody sneaking out of the zone, one of your coaching questions you could add to your toolbox might be, would an Eagle let their dinner <laughs> escape? <laughs> no. Absolutely not. If my dinner is escaping out of the zone, I better go corral it and direct it back into the zone where we can keep an eye on it. So just a thought there. And then my second thought was, as Wally was talking about his time with the the Japanese uh, women's team uh, back in, in 98, when they were trying to avoid 10 plus goal losses. Now with real coaching, they're an actual a bona fide program, so they're probably glad that Wally's out out of the mix for them. So, <laughs> I like Sorry, that. Uh, I like that with the the eagle and his dinner uh, comment. I mean, yeah, and, and that's the and that's the thing, right? When you're if you're trying to teach concepts like that, as opposed to you know telling them where to stand and where to go all the time, like you know, one of the things that like you know, you'd be talking with them about guarding the line, but you also need to have your head on a swivel, right? And recognize that there's somebody who's sneaking, trying to sneak behind you, right? So you have those conversations. Like one of the most important things that I've found in trying, at least trying to approach the game this way with the kids is that there was something that Daryl talked about in his book around creating an environment where um, kids had permission to fail, right? And, and I like we've really tried to take that to heart because if you're trying to do this kind of stuff, they're going to make mistakes and, and the other team is going to capitalize on them and you're going to give up goals. Like some kid is going to take the puck and try and go behind in front of the net, right? Or they're, they're going to try and make a pass and it's going to get intercepted. Like it's just going to happen. They're going to, they're going to forget and, you know, be focused on the game. Somebody's going to get behind them. We're going to give up a break. Like it's going to happen. So how do we react to that as coaches? And, you know, I think that that's like, that was, that's one of the toughest things, especially in, in, talking about this approach with the parents is letting them understand like you know we're we're trying we've got a process and we're trying to teach things a certain way and we know that kids are going to do things they're going to screw up sometimes they're going to make the right decision and they're just not there yet in terms of the execution to be able to do what they wanted and that's probably more of what we see than anything else right like they knew who they wanted to pass to and they probably made a pretty good decision but then the pass was you know, was was off or, or was weak or, or whatever, and it got intercepted. Like, there's there's all kinds of stuff like that. So how we react to the kids is going to dictate whether or not, you know, they're willing, if they're, let's say, the eagle and they're out on the point, whether they're willing to walk in into the slot, you know, if the play is down low, to try and engage in the offense, or whether they're going to glue themselves to the blue line so nobody gets behind them. Hell, I just had a, as you were talking there, <laughs> I just uh, had another thought that you should, and I just found I just found one on on YouTube, real easy. There's a there's a great little video. You know how eagles are always scanning for their prey. They're always turning their head. There's a great little video on YouTube of an eagle doing that. That should be uh, another coaching tool for you. See what that the eagles do? Fantastic. They they scan all the time. They're looking for their prey all the time. That's great. I like the and the prey concept is good too because they get. That's one of the that's one of the things that we were we've been working on all year is like pressure versus contain, right? So, you know, that's uh I think the prey is probably a good analogy there too. On, on the on the pressure contain thing, um, might not be quite as appropriate, <laughs> but it is in some ways. I, I've always used um, 
uh, going back to Roger Nielsen's old thing when he put his dog in front of the net back in the junior days and demonstrate to his players how the dog knew how to contain the guy trying to come out from behind the net. But, uh, but I've often showed uh, my team's video, and I don't know if you've ever seen the, the uh, cutting horse competitions at the, the Stampede Rodeo, but fantastically athletic animals, those cutting horses, when they try to, uh, they basically have to separate a, a cow from the herd. And if you if you Google cutting horse competitions, it'll be a, a great, great visual for kids in terms of, you know, not approaching th their victim, so to speak, but containing the victim where they want to contain them in a small space. So there's another that's a good one sort of suggestion for you. Oh, I appreciate that. That's a really that's a really good one. As a sideline to that, I used to ride cutting horses. <laughs> And when they separate that calf from the herd, yeah, the rider can't use his hands anymore. He has to steer the horse with his legs, or the horse is instinctively the rider is just there to, you know, stay balanced and stay on top because it's it's a very very competitive and exciting way to compete uh, in in the equestrian world. So that's a great idea to show that to kids. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's a fan, it's a fantastic event to watch, and yeah, yeah. absolutely. the The riders have to hold on for dear life onto yeah. the horn of the saddle; otherwise, they'd be they'd be out of there in a split second. Those horses are so friggin' athletic; uh, it's fun to watch. Anyway, just some thoughts there, Al. Yeah, uh, I'm not uh, sure if you or Tom were next, but I appreciate it. I just like to add one more thing too to Daryl. Like, uh, I I just like to say thank you because that that line in your book about creating an environment with, where there's sort of permission to fail has been really, really, really important. I think to to what we've been trying to do, and we've we've repeated that line with the parents and with the kids, you know, um, so many times this year. And I think uh, I think it's really important, and it's been it's been very very helpful. So, thank you. Kind of kind of change my perspective a little bit on things. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, you, have, you, have, you have no idea how happy I am to hear that. Um, I uh, really appreciate you mentioning it and that if you got something from the book that you've been able to use, that's really, uh, that's really meaningful to me. I think you're next, Tom. Yeah, I just... Uh... I think one thing that's really important in all this reading the game is that the way humans think is in patterns. And one great example of that, I, I'm sure you've all read paragraphs where they just put in the first and last letter of the word, and you can read the whole paragraph because our, you know, our, our mind doesn't read every letter in a, in a word. It finds patterns. And the same thing with playing hockey. And I 